welcome to class uh, 15 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. Uh, we have been looking uh, at uh, methods of detecting unintentional islands and this, these are essentially what we call anti-islanding algorithm and we looked at uh, passive anti-islanding methods and uh, in the last class we looked at the relationship between power mismatch uh, in between the DG and the load and the voltage level uh, after the disconnection of your upstream uh, switch. So, it could be an upstream breaker. Uh, so, what would be the voltage and the idea is if the voltage goes beyond some particular bound uh, a over voltage level or a under voltage level then you would declare that it is a uh, unacceptable situation, it is a situation of unintentional island. So, today we will uh, look at the relationship between the reactive power mismatch and the frequency deviation that would be seen uh, on the uh, in, in the island. Okay. So, this is essentially a passive anti-islanding method. Uh, assuming the same RLC uh, load model and uh, the DG model as we have earlier been discussing. discussing. Okay. So, again the assumptions are that uh, the L and C draws uh, equal uh, reactive power at uh, 50 hertz which means that uh, your Q L is equal to Q C. And in this condition, uh, essentially uh, your L and C is uh, under uh, resonance at 50 hertz and you can actually write an expression for the quality factor. You are assuming that the quality factor is uh, large. So, Q L uh, divided by P and Q C divided by P is the quality factor and you are assuming that the quality factor is uh, larger than 1. Uh, greater than or equal to 1. Okay. And you are also assuming that your DG uh, unit is operating at unity power factor which means that Q DG is 0 under nominal conditions. So, the next uh, the question is now if we have a situation where your L and C is different from what was uh, nominal then what would be your new uh, uh, new reactive power mismatch and the corresponding change in frequency. Okay. L comma C and Q F is Q L by P. And uh, D G is operating at unity power factor. Uh, if uh, actual reactive components are L prime comma C prime, then your actual re resonant frequency is F prime is 1 by 2 pi square root of L plus delta L and C plus delta C where this is L prime and this is C prime. Okay. So, you can write an expression now for the deviation in frequency. Okay. 
and uh, your f is 1 by square root of lc. So, you can writing the previous expression for f prime and you know what uh, f is, you can simplify it you will get square root of lc divided by And uh, you can then take uh, uh, f uh, prime to be a maximum level uh, or f prime to be a minimum level and then you could consider a threshold f min minus f by f is less than and this could be further simplified uh, and uh, you have minus 1 over here and minus 1 over here and uh, you could simplify it as uh, f min and then you could take the reciprocal and then you get f by f max square less than or equal to So, here we have neglected the product term delta L delta C. So, let us call this expression 1 and uh, we also know for the for your ideal uh, load case you have uh, Q equal to Q load is 0. and your delta q is essentially what comes in from your grid side in, in the model that you are having and this is q load minus uh, q d g and for the case where now you have a deviation from the nominal value this turns out to be equal to v square 1 by 2 pi f into L plus delta L so this can be written as And we know that q l is equal to q c is the quality fa factor times p. So, this can be written as uh, delta q can be written as q l divided by 1 plus delta l by l. So, 
So, because q l and q c is quality factor times uh, p, you can write it as delta q by p is equal to q f into 1 by delta l by l and this uh, this 1 plus delta l by l uh, can be simplified at taking an approximation one by of 1 plus 1 uh, plus x uh, 1 by 1 plus x so this is equal to qf So, you have now a relationship between delta q, p, q f and the difference the variations in the load and if we look at what we had, uh, we had an expression for variation in the load and your f min and f max. So, we could substitute this in the, in the, uh, in the expression that we just have to write a relationship as as 1 minus f by f min so similar to uh, what we did for the case of uh, voltage where we had a nominal voltage and then we looked at what would be the power mismatch to determine what would be the resulting uh, voltage amplitude after uh, opening of the uh, upstream breaker. Here we can look at what is the reactive power mismatch uh, assuming the load is a RLC load to see then what would be the uh, frequency deviation when you have a reactive power uh, mismatch or the reactive power that is coming in from the grid. Okay. So, we will again look at uh, 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 a few examples of what would be the frequency deviation we can expect for some uh, change in uh, reactive uh, some delta reactive power that is coming in from the, uh, from the substation or any upstream uh, opening breaker. So, we will look at an example. So, uh, DG operating with power output equal to 1 per unit. And it is operating at UPF unity power factor and the load is also considered uh, 1 per unit. So, power wise it is perfectly matched. and we will assume that on the feeder the original uh, power factor on the feeder was 0 0.707 uh, uh, lag 0 0.71 lag And uh, essentially uh, what it means is that your uh, reactive uh, uh, power being consumed by the loads on the feeder is uh, 1 by 1 divided by the power factor. So, it is about 1 per unit. Okay. Then we will assume that this particular feeder because of this uh, large reactive power that is being drawn 
has power factor correction capacitors that are added on that feeder to try and make it unity power factor. So, So, essentially it means you have added capacitor, capacitance drawing wire of 1 per unit. So, that uh, you have essentially a unity power factor coming in from your uh, upstream uh, substation breaker. Okay. Then uh, your quality factor is Q L by P load. Yes, one. And then we will assume that say uh, for some uh, variation in the value of the installed capacitance, uh, you see a actual power factor of 0.99 lag rather than unity power factor you are seeing 0.99 lag at the upstream uh, device uh, breaker. So, essentially this could mean that you are having a C prime which is uh, slightly smaller or essentially a inductive load uh, which is larger which means your L prime is again something smaller than the L that you originally thought. And then you can now calculate your delta Q that is coming in from the grid is 1 by 0.99. In this case, you are having 0.14 per unit lag essentially is the reactive power coming in from the grid. And the question is what would be the resulting uh, frequency change that you would see when a upstream, upstream breaker opens. Okay. So, you can use the relationship that we have just derived. you have 1 minus f by f max p is 1 per unit quality factor is 1. So, you have f by f max is 0.92 or your f max equal to so you can see that uh, with uh, 0.99 power factor essentially you see uh, a frequency deviation of almost uh, 4 hertz 3.9 hertz so you could say if you had set a over frequency relay at uh, 50.5 hertz that would immediately detect that a uh, islanding has occurred and disconnect your DG in response to the, uh, the feeder frequency rising to a higher value.
So, similarly we could look at what would happen uh, say instead of uh, the power factor being 0.99 lag what would be the uh, situation if your power factor was 0.99 lead that would correspond to a situation where you have a slightly lower uh, reactive load or a slightly larger value of capacitance in the uh, power factor correction capacitor bank. then you would get delta Q again is minus 0.14 per unit. So, when your upstream breaker opens S1 opens In this case the frequency would drop and you have 1 minus So, your frequency would drop to about 46.8 hertz and so in this case say if you had a, a under frequency release maybe it is set to open at 48 hertz. So, seeing 46.8 hertz it would disconnect the DG and uh, 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 say that there is a situation ab abnormal situation. So, the DG has to be uh, disconnected. So, if the DG is operated at unity power factor, and a reactive power compensation. is not perfect then uh, over and under frequency release So, so you, if you uh, again this is assuming that your uh, load model is a RLC load model and you are assuming that your DG is operating at unity power factor. Uh, in some situations it might actually be beneficial to operate the DG under non-unity power factor because you may have reactive power uh, uh, elements in your facility and you may want to operate it so that you do local compensation rather than always operate it at unity power factor. So, uh, so you have to realize that these are under uh, assumptions that uh, these uh, thresholds are valid and uh, again you may say that uh, assuming that all the loads on the feeder uh, can be approximated as a RLC load is not always valid. but uh, a again the reason why people look at RLC load as a model for uh, a situation of unintentional island is so that you can do a test that is repeatable. Okay. Uh, in fact, a more common load might be an induction machine or a, 
a machine load with uh, or a inductance uh, voltage behind a inductance type of load and if the machine has a large inertia it can actually sustain an island for quite a while depending on how large that inertia is. But there is nothing like a, a standard induction machine with uh, standard value of core loss or standard value of uh, friction, windage. Uh, these are uh, parasitic elements in a induction machine, but you could accurately specify your resistance to be of 2 percent tolerance, your inductance to be of some percent tolerance and you could actually do tests in a repeatable manner irrespective of whether it is being done in one location or the other. So, assuming the simplified RLC model for the feeder uh, allows you to conduct tests in a repeatable manner. Okay. Again uh, the other assumptions we are assuming that uh, the DG is being controlled in a with constant P constant Q. You might have situations where there might be some other methods for controlling the DG. You might control your rather than P and Q you might control your uh, direct and quadrature axis of uh, currents. Okay. So, depending on how your control is your uh, thresholds can actually also differ. Okay. Uh, also one needs to keep in mind that uh, here we are assuming a single uh, DG with uh, uh, load and uh, assuming that uh, each of uh, each of this uh, element uh, and uh, where you are switching a upstream opening as upstream breaker and we are looking at the power mismatch and the reactive power mismatch. And in an actual feeder the loads are constantly going up and down uh, your DGs may vary in a sparse set point. So, statistically you might have a duration of time where your power generated by the DG might have a small mismatch with the power being consumed by the load as the penetration of DGs on the feeder goes up. Okay. So, the chances that your delta P and delta Q becomes really small becomes higher once your uh, DG penetration goes up. Okay. So, the there is always a chance of uh, unintentional island for which uh, one needs to be uh, careful. As we can as we have seen uh, there are actually uh, implications of continuing in a sustained unintentional island. So, so we can then look at uh, uh, so, uh, see that these passive methods would work well under uh, low penetration of DG on the feeder. So, initially when there are just a few uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof and you are uh, having large loads on the feeder then there would be no problem. And another situation that uh, we uh, have just seen is that uh, uh, so, it works well uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the result that we saw from our the examples that we did is that uh, it would work well if your grid voltage amplitude and uh, frequency range is maintained in a tight range. So, So, if you look at uh, uh, a standard such as uh, IEEE 1547, which is a standard for uh, interconnecting uh, distributed energy resources with the grid, uh, they would specify say a V max of 110 percent, uh, V min of 85 percent, then you would say F max. of uh, F norm nominal plus 0.1 hertz and F min uh, 
and uh, what is suggested is that if uh, the voltage amplitude or the frequency goes out of this particular range, you disconnect in, in 100 milliseconds. So, you have an instantaneous uh, disconnection if your uh, voltage and frequency got goes out of this range and uh, if your grid is holding your nominal values in a very tight range, then such a, uh, a tight window for voltage and frequency would be acceptable. Uh, say in the Indian grid, it this would mean that uh, you may not be able to connect the DG with the grid at all. So, uh, just directly following the standards would not work in uh, all situations. You will have to look at what is realistic in a particular local scenario and then uh, see whether that particular method would uh, work or not uh, in uh, for uh, detection for example, setting of relays, detection of unintentional islands etcetera. Okay. We will look at uh, another method of uh, detection of unintentional island and uh, if, uh, that is based on looking at the direction of power flow. Uh, so, you, uh, so, if you look at a situation where uh, you have normal loads connected to the distribution system, the power that is being drawn by at your point of common coupling would be from the grid into your load okay, to your facility. And uh, when uh, you have a distributed generation source so connected at a load, then now you have the possibility that power may be sent uh, in uh, either it may be drawn into the facility if your DG power is less than the facility loads or it may be sent back out into the grid if there is excess power available at the DG. Okay. Uh, suppose the DG is controlled so that uh, power is always drawn into the facility and is not, uh, uh, not uh, so if you control the power flow to be only in the direction into the facility, then you could make use of that to detect a situation of uh, unintentional island. So, if this is by sizing the DG to be less than your uh, your load in your facility or uh, controlling your adjusting your DG operating power such that uh, it uh, does not export power at your point of common coupling, then you could uh, actually detect a situation of unintentional island. So, th uh, the reason why this is a, uh, this would be the case is that say if you have an open upstream breaker and assuming that say all other loads on the feeder goes to 0 say if your L feeder your P feeder goes to 0 then to maintain the unintentional island with the DG you need to actually send power back out at your point of common coupling. Even at 0 load you will have some losses core losses in your uh, interconnection transformer etcetera. So, you could always detect a situation where your power is flowing out from your facility to maintain your voltage on the feeder to be some finite positive value. And if you are uh, if you detect such a situation where the power is going out from the facility into the grid that means that some upstream breaker the grid has disconnected and the facility is now supporting the feeder and that can be used to detect a situation of uh, unintentional island based on the power flow direction. Okay. Uh, but you can see that uh, uh, you now have restrictions on the sizing of your DG and always ensuring that your power in the DG is less than what is being consumed on the load. So, if you uh, look at this particular case, uh, it puts restrictions on how you operate your DG which may not be actually be acceptable. Say suppose your, your DG is a, 
a photovoltaic system or a wind turbine, you may want to operate it so that you are harvesting the maximum energy possible. Uh, and uh, having such restrictions would not be uh, economically viable. So, uh, so, so, so methods of uh, uh, anti all methods of anti aliasing uh, detection uh, have some drawbacks. You might have some restrictions. You might have non-detection zones, etc., which uh, uh, might uh, lead to uh, how uh, constraints on how you operate the system. Okay. So, so now we could look at uh, uh, what are considered uh, uh, active anti-aliasing methods. And essentially, uh, active anti-aliasing methods uh, uh, interact with the DG control, and uh, uh, essentially, you could have situations where you might periodically change the operating point of the DG, uh, and because you are doing that in a periodic manner, you might have uh, power or reactive power mismatch which causes uh, detection that you have you are in an unintentional island or you might uh, look at uh, uh, inject some harmonics and when your grid is connected with the uh, the your R RLC load model you can uh, you know that the grid maintains the voltage so as soon as you are disconnected from the grid there is nothing to maintain the voltage so if you are injecting harmonics you would see a corresponding uh, harmonic distortion at your point of common coupling. Uh, similarly, you can have uh, unbalance which is detected, uh, uh, you can detect uh, changes in power factor. Uh, also, you could say try to shift your voltage uh, operating point or your frequency operating point in an active manner where your DG controls itself is trying to actually shift the operating point of the DG. Uh, and you can see that these methods are uh, are actually modifying the control of the DG in an active manner to detect an island. Okay. Some of these methods such as uh, trying to change the operating point etcetera are uh, uh, would be st uh, 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 statistical and to prob probabilistic in the sense that you might be able uh, it might work with a single DG, but when you have multiple DGs one might try to take the operating point up and the second DG might bring the operating point down and it might cancel out overall. Okay. So, uh, some of these things might work on an individual basis, but not in a large collective group. So, you will have to look at uh, the implications of uh, such situations. Also, if you look at injection of uh, uh, harmonic uh, harmonics and looking at monitoring unbalance etcetera these affect uh, power quality. So, uh, you have uh, uh, power power possibilities of uh, poor power quality, uh, imbalance, uh, instabilities in the grid etcetera, which uh, can affect the operation. Uh, so, we will look at what is the underlying methods of some of these uh, uh, active anti aliasing schemes, uh, especially the ones that uh, try to shift your frequency and voltage operating point. Essentially, what you are trying to do is uh, we saw in uh, the uh, conditions that are required to operate your island as a sustained uh, island. There are two conditions, one is the real and reactive power between your DG and the load should match and the second thing was that the operating point should be stable. Uh, so, if the operating point is not stable, then your potentially your voltage would uh, exponentially drift away from whatever is the point it was at the when the upstream breaker disconnected or the frequency might drift away. Uh, and you can make use of the fact that you can detect this drift in frequency and voltage to detect a situation of uh, unintentional island. Okay. So, essentially the active anti aliasing methods
So, uh, we uh, will first look at how uh, potentially the voltage amplitude can be shifted. So, if you remember uh, based on our RLC model for the feeder uh, and the DG, we had an expression for uh, your delta P by P. So, this was a relationship that we had and we also had uh, delta R by R So, if you look at it on a small signal basis, you have delta P by P is minus delta R by R. So, let us call this 1. Now, in the DG controls, if we add a, a term, where delta P by P norm So, essentially what you have is your, your mean power level in the DG is from your uh, MPPT algorithm or something which uh, drives your power command and you are adding a additional term to it where you are looking at deviations from the nominal voltage and adding a term k times p norm by v norm. So, essentially th this term corresponds to essentially the expression 2 and this would go say if you have a synchronous uh, machine it can go to the exciter of the synchronous machine or it can go to the in phase uh, uh, current ac uh, current command in an inverter. So, uh, based on that you could actually adjust your actual power that is being put out by the DG okay, to the governor. So, essentially this determines what would be your actual power and if you look at uh, this particular expression uh, where delta P by P norm is k times delta V by V norm and if you look at the expression for the RLC load model, the physical RLC load model, you can see that the polarity of uh, the sign between delta P uh, and the the voltage uh, and the resistance is such that uh, you could uh, essentially based on K have emulate a, a positive uh, a negative resistance. Okay. So, in a, uh, in, a, uh, in a dynamical system essentially a positive resistance gives you damping. So, a negative resistance would give you neg uh, something which is exponentially diverging. Okay. So, you can introduce an instability by controlling the term k uh, by tuning the term k to actually cause your voltage to diver diverge rather than damp down in a dynamical system. Okay. So, 
So, essentially what your dynamical resistance that is being emulated can be negative and uh, so if you look at your RLC uh, load model. So, essentially what you could have is uh, you are dyna dynamically emulating a resistance and this resistance along with your actual load resistance let us call this as R uh, emulated. So, R emulated in parallel with R would be your effective uh, uh, resistance in your feeder with uh, after anti uh, uh, after I landing and if uh, that resistance becomes effectively negative you would have a situation where dynamically you have a system which uh, would uh, instead of damp down it would essentially become unstable. You could also see what this physically uh, means. Suppose you have a situation where uh, in, uh, in response to the disconnection of uh, the grid if your voltage falls the possibility of the voltage falling could be because your power that was being injected is lesser than what is required and this particular term would then further reduce the power which means that it, the resulting voltage would fall further down and this becomes a positive loop and eventually the entire feeder voltage would collapse. If uh, the voltage rises on disconnection then this term would inject additional power causing a further rise in voltage essentially causing your final voltage to just uh, go outside your acceptable range. So, uh, we could uh, in a similar manner where uh, we uh, looked at the voltage and then altered the frequency uh, we could do a similar thing with uh, by measuring the power the react the frequency you could alter the reactive power and uh, in response to the change in frequency and the reactive power you could adjust the operation of the DG and with the objective of taking the frequency now outside the nominal range uh, we will uh, we'll start looking at this problem we may we'll be able to probably wrap it up in the next class. So, this is essentially what you do when you are having a active frequency shift. We saw in our RLC load model your Q of the load is V square by 2 pi F L and the nominal value is was 0 and now we will look at what would be the situation if uh, your frequency uh, is something which uh, shifted to f plus delta f and what would be the net reactive power that is being drawn by the load. So, you can write your delta q load the original value was 0 with the change in frequency you would have delta q load equals
and taking the 1 plus delta f by f term to the numerator this is approximately equal to 1 minus delta f by f and we saw again the assumption that we had was that q l and q c are resonant at 50 hertz. So, you could write this as your delta q delta q that is coming from your grid uh, due to a change in frequency would be So, if you plot say frequency versus uh, uh, your q load and plot it close to your nominal range, essentially you would have a curve with a negative slope and uh, your load is resonant at 50 hertz. So, at 50 hertz your q is uh, 0 and if your frequency drops by some delta f, then essentially you would require some additional uh, delta q or if your frequency rises, then uh, essentially the load would act more capacitive because it is a par parallel RLC model that we are assuming for the load. Okay. So, then we could look at what would happen if uh, there is a L and C variation around nominal uh, and uh, essentially what we will do is we will look at the change in uh, the operating reactive power of the DG to be similar to what would happen when there is a nominal L and C variation that is happening on this particular island. So, if you have So, this is the nominal curve and suppose you had uh, your, uh, your L and C to be uh, say L minus delta L and C minus delta C. Essentially what would happen over there is that uh, your uh, effective power factor correction capacitance is less or L minus delta L means that your reactive power that the load is drawing is more. So, you are adding a delta Q load. So, you could think of it as corresponding to a new uh, higher frequency at which it would settle. So, this would say let us call it as some F max and say this would be your, your plus delta Q load. Similarly, you could look at a situation where your L and C parameters where L plus delta L or C plus delta C, then you could think of it as essentially in the parallel RLC load your reactive power would drop or it would settle in at a lower frequency F min. So, uh, so, so we will look at the uh, a change in operating point of your DG to emulate a equivalent uh, change in uh, in your L and C uh, L and C values, uh, and use that to see what would be the change required to actually uh, uh, cause uh, your frequency to just be driven out to be driven to a very large value or to a 
very uh, small value. We will do this in the next class. Thank you.